Dan Nussbaum. I'm the Assistant Director for Professional Development at Alacra Services. I, for those of you who don't know me, I um, work with all students and graduates, but I have a focus on students in their last year of law school and then the recent grads. So welcome. Um, we're going to talk about things to do in your final year that should hopefully help with employment afterwards. Um, I wanted to read um, the bios for our um, alumni that are here. And so uh, first we have Nikki Din. Um, who graduated from GGE in 2010 with a specialization certificate in public interest law and was a member of the Pro Bono Honor Society. Following her graduation from law school, Ms. Din was awarded the first public interest fellowship ever awarded by the Vietnamese American Bar Association in Northern California. Her fellowship gave her the opportunity to work at the Asian Pacific Islanders Legal Outreach Office, which you all know as PILO, where she remains working today. Uh, PILO is a community-based social justice organizations serving the Asian Pacific Islander communities in the Great Bay Area. But you also serve more, my clients are very diverse, despite what we say. Yeah, yeah. So she covers a, a wide range of, of clients. Before coming to GGU, Ms. Din graduated from UC, UC Irvine with a bachelor's degree as a double major in criminology, law and society, and psychology and social behaviors. Ms. Michelle, tell me if I don't pronounce your last name right. It's, Ginger. 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 Okay, thank you. And she's also a graduate of 2010. She works at the EEOC. Um, Ms. Ginger graduated from GGU in 2007 um, and currently holds a position as a federal investigator with the EEOC. Uh, she's responsible for enforcing federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate, discriminate against a job applicant or an employee because of <coughs> race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, which is 40 or older. Disability or genetic information. Ms. Um, Ginger. Ginger, thank you. Ms. Ginger began her career at EOC as a legal intern in her uh, 2L year. Uh, while at GGU, she worked as a teaching assistant and was part of the Leadership Development Council. Her current goals include advancing her career in the federal government, focusing on employment law, and alternative dispute resolution. Um, Kayla Hirschbein is a 2011 graduate. She's with the Institute for Fishery Resources. And she received her award for Outstanding Public Interest Student of the Year. Was that in your last year here? And she um, graduated with a Public Interest Environmental Law Specialization Certificate. She's currently employed as an attorney. Well, those are two certificates, right? Public Interest and Environmental Law. She's currently employed as an attorney and policy advisor at the Institute of Fishery Resources and the Golden Gate Salmon Association. A water law and fisheries policy specialist, Kayla enjoys practicing environmental law from the fishing industry perspective. IFR is a nonprofit organization that represents the interests of small family commercial fishermen and fishing communities along the Pacific coast by working to conserve and protect the fisheries resources on which they depend. Similarly, GTSA, also a nonprofit, is fighting to restore California's historic salmon runs for the communities and businesses that rely on salmon as a long-term, sustainable, commercial, recreational, and cultural resource, which I support because I like to eat salmon. <laughs> <laughs> While at GTU, Kala was the Pacific Region Editor of the Environmental Law Journal, a Law and Leadership Fellow, and an active member of the Source. In her current roles, Kayla also works as a supervising attorney for several spectacular GTU interns. Of course they're spectacular. Um, Ms. Jeannie Lepchik, I guess I've really known her forever, but I can't, I can't pronounce the name. She's with Parkinson, Toon, and Castlewick. Ms. Lepchik graduated from GTU in 2011. She's currently employed as an associate um, doing workers' comp defense, which includes representing self-insured corporations. While as a law student, Ms. Lepchik held the position of secretary for the Student Bar Association and was a teaching assistant. Jeannie also interned at various law firms around the Bay Area, including Ideal and Cytel, Bracamontes, and Blasek. Thank you, a plaintiff's side litigation firm. Before law school, Jeannie graduated from UC Santa Barbara, where she double majored in law and society and communication. Uh, Francisco Silva, also a 2011 graduate, is with Dundick, Gutweiler, Ribbon, and Strike. How do you pronounce that? Stuger. Okay. At least I got the debt while, right? Um, Ms. Sil Mr. Silva graduated in, I think I said that, with a special day, special day certificate in tax. He's currently employed as an associate attorney, um, specialized in the area of state planning, trust, and education probate. While a law student, um, Francisco worked as a judicial law clerk in the Superior Court of Santa Clara County. Before GGU, Francisco graduated. 
graduated, from San Jose State, and your degree in business management. Okay, that's an awful. So my first, my first question for the panelists, and for this one, I think I will just kind of go in on the, the row, um, I guess we'll start with Nikki, is what courses, activities, and work did you do during law school, especially in your third year? For my third year, I definitely took it easy with my case or my class schedule. So I really recommend if you have the opportunity to take less classes in your last semester to do that. Um, this might be too late for some of you. But that gave me a break. Um, during the school year, I was really active in student work. So Jimmy and I were in the SBA together. I was part of the National Postal Board. Um, and I was part on the Vietnamese American Bar Association Board, which later led to my the first person being fellow from that organization. So it all tied it together. But I kept a really active schedule my first um, semester, and I really took it easy for my second semester so I could prep for the, wouldn't be burned out for the bar. That was just the same. Um, I always worked during law school, and I always had an internship or something on the side, because it's easier for me to learn um, on the job than through their theories at, um, in the school, like in a classroom. So if you're that type of person who needs to see what it looks like before you can commit to, to something, I would suggest you know squeezing in another internship if you can. Yeah, I actually second Nikki's uh, recommendation of doing another internship. I interned for the Judicial Council of California my last year, and I took a lot of our related courses. Um, I can't remember what it was called. It was the contracts and property two-unit course preparing me for the bar. That was great, um, but. I always had an internship, and that's how I found my position now. Um, I needed to keep active in order to keep my eye on the goal. I agree. <clears throat> I would take it easy and take what you want, take what you're interested in, and take things that always kind of sound cool when you were looking at the course catalog that you had to take comm or evidence or something else instead. So take what you want um, with the bar in mind. I think you were talking about special problems. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I would take at least one special problems class um, because it really does get you ready for the bar in a way that just kind of sets your mind at ease that you'll figure it out by the end of that semester how to tackle an essay. Um, and as painful as PLW is, I don't know if any of you have taken PLW yet, um, don't blow it off because it's a third of the bar and that class prepares you way better than bar prep. So, you know, suck it up and do what they tell you to do. I agree with everybody with that, what everybody said so far. It's all dead on. I would just say that if you have any idea what you do want to practice in or if you know what's interesting to you, you should take classes to that because I have to say, a lot of people, if you have, I mean, there's nothing wrong with sampling, but I think by the third year, maybe people expect you to like, kind of know what you want to do. And if you get a resume or something like that from somebody who kind of doesn't have a focus or anything, because I knew I wanted to be in a state planner from the get-go, so all my classes were focused towards that. So when I came out, I was able to say, this is what I want to do, and I at least took this last year to specialize in that. So I think that's very helpful. And also, this time, two years ago, when I was at 3L, I was in the hunt for a law clerk job because I saw the importance of getting your foot in the door somewhere, and somewhere where you could see yourself being after you took the bar. Because most of the people I know who were able to get law clerk positions before they graduated were able to stay on there and then they got associate positions after they passed the bar. So I would just say the most important thing is to try and focus your curriculum. Maybe a little bit different than other people have said. <laughs> and then the second thing is look for a law clerk position somewhere, even if it's just part time, because I was working only like 20 hours a week. But it was a fantastic experience and they liked me and it lets you. And from the firm's perspective, they're incurring less expense training you, teaching you things, because your billing rate's lower, or however much time it takes is much lower for them, so they can invest in you. And then once they see how you fit in with the dynamic of the firm, then they're like, well, now we can take you on as an associate. And I think that's the general consensus, well, amongst most uh, private firms. I, of course, second everything everyone said. I want to side note. Use this woman, she's wonderful. <laughs> Even if, as just a source of comfort, she came on right as we had, uh, were graduating and was a very constant source of comfort for me when I was, you know, six months post bar, you know, licensed attorney, you not know, able to find a job, which is how I'll come later. But use her, go see her, she's wonderful to talk to. 
That was my second. Um, I especially want to second what Cal said about PLWs because I'll tell you something. When it's getting down to the wire on the bar and you need to focus on studying for the subjects that you don't know, you won't need, I did not, I barely did anything for PLW while studying for the actual bar because of how well I utilized that class in law school and used it to prepare myself while I was taking it. So I promise you, you will save yourself at least 10 hours of bar prep if you use the class in the correct way and you can use that time to study for something else. Um, I was really focused on intellectual property and sports and entertainment law while I was at GGU. I still have an interest in that, although somehow I found myself in workers' comp defense, which, believe it or not, does actually have a role in sports. Um, <laughs> and so, because workers' comp is everywhere, I don't even know why until I started working for it, but literally the school was insured for workers' comp. Like everything, anyway, that's different. Because most of us are workers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I would, as Francisco said, I would definitely try to take electives that go towards an area, even if you think you might be interested in it. Um, and unfortunately, it might be too late, but I would, like, if you can have it so that your last semester you're taking less courses. I think I was taking eight units my first semester and seven my second because of summer school, and I know it's too late, but if you can work it so that you do have a lighter schedule your second semester, <laughs> that will make a big difference. It'll allow you to rest before bar prep. And no matter what anybody says, you do not have to start studying for the bar right now. I'm <laughs> sorry, you don't. There is no, no matter what anybody says, aside from the special problems courses, and I know that someone, this is a question coming later, but some of my friends took the um, advanced with Muhammad, the writing class, which is like an advanced version of PLW. If you have a way to get into that, they all felt like they benefited. Cal, were you in that? No. They all felt like they benefited greatly from that, so if there's one thing, you, if you could try to get into that now, I would suggest doing that. I didn't, but don't start studying for the bar other than that. So my next question had to do, to what extent while you were in law school, especially your last year, did you reach out to attorneys and professors that you knew to talk about you know, post-bar opportunities and talk to new attorneys or expand your network? And in what ways did that help you when you were finished taking the bar and had to figure out how you were going to find a job? I guess I'll start again. Um, I definitely believe in networking, and it's not just about making superficial relationships with people you see a lot. It's really to find people you mesh with, find people that have, find people who have similar interests as you. Um, I really enjoyed eating in the city, um, and so a lot of times I would just have lunch with people I found an interest in what they were doing, have lunch with them, and then got to know them as a person, not just as an attorney or a resource. Um, networking really helped me um, throughout my career, and it also, you know, the moment I got my staff position as an immigration attorney at Apilo, I immediately networked out to a bigger um, audience of immigration attorneys. You know, now I need to get to know everybody that does different types of immigration work, and that was so helpful in, in my career, even after a year or two after I graduated. Um, professors are also a great source of. Um, Girl, if you need to find a job afterwards. I had a lot of um, colleagues during school who found their really awesome internships just through like the random love of a professor knowing somebody. All of a sudden there's a ninth circuit, you know, clerkship open and she was able to get into that. Um, I got one of my first internships um, because Jonathan Chu, you guys know who he is? Um, Ruth Aspel is an, an administration judge in Oakland and she just is an alum here, she just happened to have an opening and she didn't advertise it with anybody. But he happened to know that I was looking for an internship and he's like, oh, why don't you just shoot her an email? Well, that email led to a position there which led to me meeting another judge who was connected to my current organization and gave me a great referral. Um, and that's how I got my foot in the door at the Kaiser Outreach in the first place. So all these connections, even though it doesn't make sense when you first meet all these people, it ends up working together because the network in San Francisco is so good. Everybody seems to know each other in some way or another. I um, was fortunate to have a fantastic supervisor through my internship with the EEOC, and I maintained um, sometimes an email, sometimes a phone call, sometimes a lunch out um, type of relationship with her um, through the what two years between my internship with her and um, getting my position at the EEOC, and she now my coworker. Um, she's also great in that she kept in contact with me as well and is very 
dedicated to making sure that her interns um, have a good experience. But from there, once I received this position, um, I also immediately started uh, getting to know other um, investigators, attorneys, and mediators, um, both within my organization and with the um, firms and uh, solo practitioners I would mostly deal with. And now I actually have a Rolodex of uh, business cards that I can go through and have casual relationships with most of them. Um, <laughs> and uh, and even now, um, I I actually get uh, phone calls from DG Regrets um, asking me about internship opportunities with the EEOC, which um, if anybody's interested, I can give you some information about. Uh, so it's just a working relationship, and don't be afraid to just approach someone that you casually know or have a some sort of connection to. Um, everybody is completely open, and they've all been there to help you out. Um, I also think, for me, excuse me, um, uh, I really not purposefully worked hard to develop relationships with professors, but kind of just ended up being something that uh, and uh, was very helpful for me. I got my internship my second year from a professor, and that's where I'm still working now. Um, and. I did other things over the course of, I studied abroad um, between my second and third year, and I did other internships, but I always kind of kept showing up at this place, and so that's why I'm still there. But, um, uh, and I, after an interview, I would always follow up and try to take whoever interviewed me for coffee or lunch or something, and that I think was helpful, because I work with a lot of them now professional capacity and we've developed kind of a personal relationship to on the side. So that's been really useful. So I would say follow up and be really persistent. <coughs> Persistence is what gets you a job, especially in this economy. And when you followed up with these folks, would you just go out and have a casual conversation to kind of increase the relationship that you had? Or were you specifically, during your last year, were you specifically talking to them about the possibility of working with them? Or? It was more informational because they had already decided to hire somebody else. Um, or, you know, how did you, yeah, it was basically informational. How did you get this job? And what did you do? And what did, you, you know, compared to what I said and what I have, what did the other person you hired have? And um, what can I do to make myself more of a viable candidate or something like that? Um, and now I'm glad I didn't work for those places because I love where I am now. But, um, I think it was good to reach out and to be somebody that was visible. And this, I, I work in the environmental law community, and it's a very tight community. And so um, it's nice to have those relationships, and it's gone back now years just from when I was in law school. So basically, be persistent. Uh, I agree. It's a thing. Uh, I have to just have to say, I use uh, law career services a lot. Um, I remember that, like I said previously, I had two years ago up to like, this time, I was in law career services all the time, bugging to write this down around all the I was like, I need, I want to walk work somewhere, I want to do estate planning. And, and she, I just remember there was this tool at the time where you could see the alumni, it was some kind of online alumni directory, but she'd say contact alumni who practice in your area and just have information on your view. And so I remember I went through and I saw some other attorneys who had graduated from who practiced in San Francisco. and. Sent them emails, and of course, like who would turn away just a law school student wanting to just get some information? And I met with several people, and I had a couple um, emails with them back and forth, and then through Susanna Ronald, because I got this an interview for this job, which I now had at the time as a law clerk position, was from somebody who had recently transferred from the firm to GGU. So I really think you really have to be diligent and do those informational interviews. I remember in PLW, I mean, Caleb in the same class. She just said, what's your biggest pet peeve with GGU? And they were like, all they tell you to do is informational interviews. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, don't knock those. Those are so helpful. I mean, and after I accepted this law clerk position, a month later, one of the guys who I did an informational interview said, hey, we have a spot open for you. Would you like to come in? And I said, thank you so much, but I already accepted a job somewhere else. And you just can never sell yourself short. Like, you, 
you really have to just go out there and meet people and talk to them because you ask them about themselves and who doesn't love talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. And then you get to elaborate, oh, I'm the same, or oh, like these are my interests too. And they, and they always have good advice for you. So I would never like turn away from commission interviews, just pursue those as much as you can. And, um, and I always follow up with them and just see how they're doing. And that's basically how I would say to do it if you want to try and get in somewhere. And on that note, because you've already heard about the informational interviews and all that, I'll tell you, I am more of a social person. I like to make connections with people based on things aside from the law, whether it's the Giants or really any sports team in the area. But it's, I, what I would recommend, aside from all that, because I agree with all that, I did all that, is reach out to your old employers. I am still in contact with every single attorney that I interned for during law school. I still get invited to happy hours. That's a great way to reconnect. When I was applying for jobs post-law, the, the, the main, main important reason you want to stay in contact with these people is because they will be so much more inclined to give you a glowing review someday when a future employer calls them. I can't tell you how great it was to be able to because I knew I was still in contact to be able to shoot him an email, even three months down the road if I had talked to him in three months and say, hey, just so you know, so-and-so from such and such firm may be contacting you for a review. But in the meantime, reach out to these people. Hey, hope all is well. You never know, maybe they're having a good day. Maybe they'll be like, hey, you know, the firm's going out for drinks, why don't you join us? You want to stay connected with these people, assuming you had a good relationship and assuming they're people that you like spending time with. I was fortunate enough to have at least the supervisor at my second internship, which I ended up staying after three semesters, which we'll get to later on. But um, sh she and I are still in touch. We're going to meet for drinks in a month. <coughs> we're still friends. We're like, fr like good friends, actually. We keep each other posted on our personal lives and our work lives. And you never know when those relationships will come back to help you, which is kind of what all these people alluded to, that you just want to always, obviously never burn bridges. We're smarter than that. We made it through law two years of law school. Just always <laughs> keep, you guys will survive your last year. Just always keep open the lines of communication, whether it be socially or professionally. Let me just check my out. Yeah, so that would be my, aside from all of the professional stuff, socially stay in touch with these people. Now, one thing I want to add to what Nikki said is about professors. Um, one thing that the school is trying to do is, you all know a lot of the professors from the classes you're taking, but a lot of times they have a background and they have connections with people they know in different areas of the law where they practiced before they came here. So we're trying to get a more comprehensive list that you can look at, and then if professors have actually practiced in certain areas that you don't know that they have, you can go and talk to them and say, who do you know, and who can I get to go talk to, and you give them more you know, background about this area of law, or whatever your questions you have. Um, that they can help you with um, that may be in an area that you're interested in or want to get into. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, my next question had to do sort of, is there one or several things that you thought were the most important to do in your last year? And maybe added with that, are there things that you didn't do which you really think you should have done in your last year? And we don't have to go down the road, let's let whoever is ready to throw something, throw some things out. I'd say relax. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> um, and really don't forget about the bar. Um, you hear from professors and from other people that you need months and months and months and you should be doing five hours a week or 10 hours a week starting now. And I think you should enjoy being with your friends and enjoy being with your loved ones and go on fun weekend trips and you know, don't take this last year too seriously. You do your work, but um, save your energy. I was so burnt out, I was really worried about tackling Martha because I was so burnt out. Um, and I found this great energy and I actually really enjoyed studying for the bar, which is kind of sick. <laughs> but um, but <coughs> enjoy yourself. This is you know, your last year of law school, you're almost done. You, it's a huge accomplishment. Enjoy it and um, try to relax. Because once you start working, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah your life's over. You've got lots of goals. I'd like to say, Kayla, I, I totally agree. You have to take it easy. I mean, Barbary, if, if, I think most of you will end up doing Barbary, but um, that is so structured, so comprehensive. I mean, I didn't touch studying. I took um, 
about Crim Pro, I think, as my special problems thing, which I thought was really helpful, but it really helps you just learn how to write essays. And it really helps a lot of people who maybe don't write the best essays, but Barbary is so comprehensive, like you don't have to worry about the bar. They're gonna hold your hand and take you through start to finish everything you need to know. So don't get caught up on the stress where people are telling you you have to start studying like Kayla said, like absolutely not. It's unless you think that you're absolutely like like have no competency in something, maybe, but like even then, I mean you're you'll be fine. Just make sure that once it starts, you just stick with the schedule that Barbary sets for you and it's and that's when you can put it off. But spend time with your friends and family now. Do things you want to do now, because once you start Barbary, that's over. Like, your life is over, basically. So. For 10 weeks, though. It's not <laughs> for 10 weeks, it's over, and then you have like, the waiting, so that's a whole different battle. <laughs> so. I would think long and hard about, I, like I had mentioned earlier, I was doing, during the last year, I was doing my second and third semester in a row at the same firm, and at that time, I was still very interested in intellectual property, because I thought that would be my avenue into sports and entertainment which clearly it wasn't. Um, so I would think think hard about, you know, there is something to be said about ha having a resume when you get out of law school and, oh, these people kept you on for three semesters, they must have really appreciated what you did for them, and that I was able to speak to that in my interviews. But if there is some other area of the law you think you might be interested in, or even something that you just kind of want to do for fun, go do it. I, I'm not saying I would change my experience, other than I would definitely try to clerk for a judge or get or intern at the DA's office because that opens up a whole new world of opportunities once you've graduated and passed the bar that I feel like I didn't have because of the experience that I lacked and I had all private sector experience. But again, I knew I wanted to practice private sector, so it was fine. But just think about that. Think about maybe opening up to something new or remaining where you are if they'll allow you to. There's benefits to both. Going off that, I, I wish I had, had more a more varied experience. I only worked for government agencies, um, for the D Judicial Council, EEOC, um, the uh, San Francisco prisons, and, and GCC, Law Care Services. Uh, but I only worked with public agencies, and I wish I had that private sector experience, because now if I wanted to transfer to the private sector, it would be very difficult for me to do so. Um, and also, yours with the relax. Uh, one thing that I really like that I did is I chose my last semester's classes based on their final schedule. So first, whether or not they had a final, and then second, when the finals were. So I wouldn't be stressed out. Um, I think I had two finals that year for that semester. It was great. Um, and then third, get all of your ducks in a row before um, graduation. So anything financial, don't worry about your loans. Um, yeah, they're going to be there after after the bar. That's after the bar. Um, one of my peers had a um, housing problem at that time. He had to commute from Sacramento to the city every day for some reason to do bar prep and totally burnt him out. And um, get this is going to sound funny, but get your um, food schedule. Situated. One of my friends did the nutrient system thing where she just had her food, she put it in the microwave, whatever. It worked for her, she was glad she did it because she didn't have the stress of her food. I think that's a bit, a bit much, but you know, the little things you don't have to worry about. Just go to toasters every day. I definitely think you should take it easy your last semester if you can, um, and we have the room in your schedule to do that. Um, something we haven't mentioned is the professional responsibility exam and also the moral character application, I would suggest to do it now. Um, I had some friends that did it later, and so even after they passed the bar, um, they could not get sworn in. They just, their application was not uh, finished yet, or they haven't even received approval for it yet. So whether you um, want to think about those things now or not, um, I think applying in the winter time during your break is a genius time to set apart to do it. Um, and also planning to take the professional responsibility test um, now if you can. Um, I had to take it like more than once. So you don't want to take the bar and then have to study for it for the August test. It's just the most draining uh, experience. Um, I didn't do that, but I had some friends that you know, decided last minute to take the PR test and then failed the first time. Had to take it again after the bar in August and you know, I ended up. <laughs> It was fun. You know, I was off vacation and they were studying again. 
setting on vacation. There's something to be said though. I was failing by significant amounts. I was sick when I took I took it three times. I'll just admit that. <laughs> <laughs> that stupid 65. Oh. <laughs> anyway, there's something to be said though for bar prep because I had studied on my vacation post bar. I literally <coughs> took the bar and three days later I was studying to the wrong character. Shoot me. <laughs> I laid on the deck in Tahoe, put my head in my book, and told my mom, I think I'm going to learn about osmosis because I cannot look at this anymore. But anyway, I, we, my friend and I, who also failed it two times, we killed it by like 30 points just because you studied with the bar, you literally learned how to take those questions. So if you don't pass, it's not the end of the world. You'll be fine. You'll pass it by flying colors. I can pretty much guarantee it. <clears throat> I just wanted to add one other thing as to your question about what I personally, if I could go back and do it all over again, I would 150% join mock trial or take more trial advocacy classes because I do a form of litigation now and I wish I had more experience in that. And I think that if you ever end up in a firm, um, criminal or civil, where you are a trial attorney or doing litigation, I think that that will really help you. So if it's not too late, I would definitely, if you have any interest in being a trial attorney, I would definitely join those classes in the program. Before my next question, um, I think you remind me of something about the fall character. I, I would second that you do that as early as possible. I work with some graduates who um, do, do it, did it kind of late, but also you don't know who you're going to get to be looking at it, and some of them take a long time to review your materials. So I work with graduates who have passed the bar, and they, it's two or three months, and they still haven't um, gotten their approval on the moral character. Waiting for all that time, and nobody knows, you know, for sure if they, you know, when they're going to get it. And so it's hard for employers to go ahead and hire you. So try to do that as early as you can. Um, my next question had to do more with post bar, and I know you sort of addressed some of this, but if there are some things you think that, um, since you have this audience right now, um, you would recommend that they do after they've taken the bar. I think if you can to take that break, you know, give yourself that break. And it sounds like we're being really nice to you. This is probably the first time in your law school career people are telling you to take it easy. But right after the bar, you're going to go in that mode to get the job. Um, November is when the results come out, and after then, everybody is you know really eligible to be hired. For a lot of firms, they weren't eligible for before. Um, I was just talking to Michelle, after school you don't have summers anymore, um, you never have this opportunity to really do this anymore, um, this is your life as well, you guys are in the prime times of your life, so get something that you wanted to get out of the way during that post-bar period. Um, I wouldn't, I didn't, I took a bar trip and I didn't have a job lined up and I knew, I knew it was going to be stressful later, but um, I ended up applying for my fellowship abroad. Um, through the connections I had, and I was able to get a job lined up later. So I still gave myself that time, and it worked out just fine. Um, a lot of my friends gave themselves the time, and then things will work out later, but um, you never get that time again. So do yourself a favor, do your partners a favor, maybe your family members a favor, and give them some, some like normal you time. Yes, um, after the bar, I took all of August off. I literally just sat there um, recovering, and it was great. I told myself I wouldn't even think about seriously looking for a job until after I came back from my bar trip, which my mom and I went on for September. Um, and when I came back, that's when I was seriously looking for a job hunt. Uh, I was calling people every other day, um, looking online, contacting law career services all the time. And um, after one month and very few bites, I went and contacted my my supervisor was from the EEOC, and she said, well, if you're, on the, if you're still looking for a job, um, come intern with us again, again, after you graduate from law school and take the bar, and um, when you can leave, you can leave, and you can choose your hours, whatever. So I went there, I was working for free yet again um, for a month, and then finally a position opened up. Um, but I knew not to stress. But at that point, too, I gave myself a deadline. I said, if I am not, if I'm working for, um, by the end of the year, so for another two months, and there's still no job in sight, then I'm going to leave and go somewhere else and try to fish other waters. Um, but it worked out. I would, I regret not going on a bar trip. I wish I'd gone on a bar trip. Um, a good friend and his wife like settled up their apartment and 
backpacked around everywhere. So I wish I'd done that. But I'm going to plug um, Lior and the Bridge Fellowship because I did that and it let me stay at my job for those few months, those few critical months where you like have no money coming in, nobody's gonna hire you because you're not a lawyer yet. And um, you wake up every morning still dream like reciting little statements in your head you are. <laughs> Um, so I would highly, especially if you're uh, interested in public interest, which I was, I never was interested in working for a firm, I never sought out those kinds of opportunities. Um, the Bridge Fellowship was great, and a lot of my friends did it, and um, it really helped you feel employed and get start to feel like it will, you know, like you have a job and maybe it will turn into a job. Um, so I would talk to Lee more about that. And where I work, we'll take bridge fellows. Yeah, just so you know what the bridge fellowship is, and you can still take your bar trip to some extent, yeah. is um, that is, and every year it's going to be a little different. But for instance, this year um, we're, we have the fellowships for three months. So if you have a job in the nonprofit uh, agency or government agency, um, then we give you a certain stipend to kind of help you, um, you know, get some money in while you're doing volunteer job for part-time and it's running September, October, November. We're going to have another one for December, January, February. We might have one this spring as well. So it gives you that opportunity to volunteer, get more experience, get confidence, get connections and things like that. But if you get something, if you have something lined up um, beforehand, the application process is really easy and so you could still go on, you know, a pretty good bar trip and then start your um, volunteer position in September. Did you have a quick I just quick question. How many of those bridge fellowships are there? Leo's right there, but it's it's very <coughs> number. So do you, what is it this time? Um we have seventy five to eighty. Uh, we're still shaking out exactly how much how much funds we have this year. We constantly look to expand it because we want to make sure that the program remains robust. Uh, but there are quite a few. I will tell you that I don't foresee there being a problem this year turning anybody away, and I don't foresee that being a problem next year. The problem, I think, in our office and for the school will be to ensure that students actually apply for these things. We have the same question. So by this time, we had maybe 20. Five. So for this, this call it the fall phase, September through uh, the end of November, there's, uh, there's about 22. But um, many of those people applied after the priority deadline. So again, it's not an issue of turning people away. And you know, I work with a lot of nonprofits, so there are sister organizations all over the Bay Area, and everybody would like to have Bridge Fellow. Um, everybody could use the extra help, and we actually give you guys a lot of hands-on, you know, direct client representation type of experience. So it's well worth it if you haven't had a lot of experience when you're looking for to really build that, um, you know, your resume up a little bit more for the final push. Yeah, and it helps when you're going out, you're saying, you know, people, lawyers are saying, well, what are you doing? You're saying, well, I'm working in, you know, a PILO and, and doing X, Y, and Z, and, you know, you seem like you're really engaged with your profession. Um, so it's, it's a really good thing to do. Um, I didn't take a bar vacation. I took, I think the bar last day was like 29th of July. My birthday was August 1st, and then I went back to a few days later. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, I, I guess. Spinny Superman. <laughs> I, I mean, it's after you take the bar, I mean, it's just like such a weight off your shoulders that, I don't know, I, I don't know, this is my personality, I just want to go back to work. And I, I guess it was a little different for me because I had a law clerk job, and so I just wanted to get back and just get back in the room. Because I had to just they gave me a two and a half month it's basically where I could have I even studied for the bar and I just went back and I mean yeah it was just me personally but like I said I, I think for maybe it's a little for the private sectors but if they want to see you like sell your heart and soul to them or like they want you to like basically show that you're dedicated and I kind of felt like I wanted them to know that like I wanted to get back into the groove of things because I had been gone for two and a half months even though they know, they know you're studying for the bar maybe they, to them you're just it's an empty office and so they want a warm body in there. So I go back. But I mean, if you if your schedule works out and your financing works out, then by all means, like go for it. Like I, a lot of people I know were like, the next day I was in Italy, and I was just like, oh, 
<laughs> so, but yeah, that's my. I have a few things to touch on because this is my area that I feel like I can help you guys the most. First and foremost, after you take the bar, you guys, they talk about vacations, all that, whatever, do what you got to do. When it gets down to really applying for jobs, I'm not going to lie to you, it could get downright depressing. You are sending out cover letter and resume after cover letter and resume, and you're not hearing back, you're not getting any advice, and all of a sudden, you'll no also you'll notice that right before the holidays, it is dead. There's nothing new on LCS, there's nothing on Craigslist, which I'm going to plug in a second. There's nothing, it's just nothing. So what I recommend doing is creating a number in your head, or whatever it is, where you wake up every day, you wake up, you work out, you structure your day, so it almost feels like you're going to a full-time job and you apply to a certain number, whatever that number is for you, that makes you feel productive so that you are sleeping at night. Because like Cal said, the post-bar anxiety can sometimes be worse than the pre-bar anxiety because now you're starting to stress about life in general and a job and things like that. You just need to find a way to make yourself feel productive during those days so that you can sleep at night. And I promise you something will work out. I am one of those people that took me six months to find a job and I love what I'm doing. And every single interview I went to that didn't work out, Literally, how serendipity like, only led me to where I am right now, which I love. Second note, use Craigslist. No offense to LCS, but a lot of employers, I think, find it too too much of a burden. To, I don't know if they have to fill something out or what they have to do. But I, I would compare. There were so many more job postings on Craigslist than there were on the school website. Uh, not that, that, again, that's nothing against LCS. They do a great job, and they, they send you emails that are catered to your area of interest. And I applied to every single job on LCS that I was notified for. <coughs> They're great. But use Craigslist as a supplement to that. Craigslist is how I found my job, 110%. That was the only place it was posted. I got a job on Craigslist. I have living proof that it worked. <laughs> on that note, also, especially if you want to move to a different city or a different state, contact your friends that went to law school in other cities. Ask them for their login information to their version of LCS. I had one that went to USC. I was, I was getting ready. To, I'm dead serious. I was getting ready to move to LA because I could not find a job in San Francisco, and I was getting ready to take the New York part. There were lots of backup plans. Um, which we don't have to talk about because that'll come. But ask your friends for their login information and log into their school website and see what job postings are in other cities. Um, it's not going to work in San Francisco because LCS is the same as USF, as Hays, and they're all the same. Not to interrupt, not to interrupt Jeannie, but um, if you don't have friends in other cities, we have a <laughs> we have a reciprocity agreement with other ABA schools where you can essentially do that. So you, can you don't need to fraudulently impersonate your friends. <laughs> <laughs> She already had a job. She wasn't using for anything. I mean, you're not going to offend anyone by asking for that, obviously. <laughs> sometimes these, I, you know, you never know. So these are the advice that may come in handy sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two more things. Use the time when you, it's six months and you're like at your lowest low. I had moved back in with my aunt and uncle on the other side of the city because I couldn't afford my apartment anymore. Like, SHIT may hit the fan and you may hit rock bottom, but I promise you, GGU is there for you and will help you. This woman, that man, everyone was a huge source of even just comfort, and you will find something because people all over the city are GGU alums. People are looking at our law school like, I'm so proud to say that I came from GGU because all of our people are recognizing how successful our graduates are becoming. So, I did an internship at Bear Essentials. It had, you did not need a lottery for this. It happened to be posted on the school website. It was literally organizing files. But let me tell you something, still in contact with all of them. My cousin's looking for a job. I contacted my old supervisor at Bear Essentials, got her resume in. You, you have to utilize, and on that note, apply to anything and everything. I have hundreds of cover letters on my computer. I applied to paralegal positions. I applied to legal assistant positions, because you never know. Maybe you did into the paralegal before you passed the bar, and they want to hire you because you do such a good job. So apply to anything and everything. And lastly, use this opportunity to figure out what you want to do. Because I gave up on the sports and entertainment for a while, and I figured out through all the interviews I went on that I definitely wanted to do defense. And that's why I ended up where I am. I was able to focus my search more towards my area of interest. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's my story. And also, um, be creative about how you go about looking for a job. One of my best friends from law school, um, she, started calling around to different criminal defense firms. Um, she wanted to be criminal law forever. And then just no one was hiring. So she decided to branch out to her second choice, which was family law. She had never worked in family law. Everything she had done was with DAs. 
Um, so one attorney said, I have no openings, but you can come with me to court. So every time he would go up um, and get up and stand in court, um, he would say, I am so-and-so, I'm an attorney for such and such, and this is my assistant, Chelsea, and she is looking for a job. She is a new graduate. <laughs> every single time. After two weeks, um, opposing counsel actually approached her and said, that's really interesting. I've, I've um, had this position open for months. I've had 70, 70 applications. I don't like any of them. Here's my card. She was hired the next week. Oh, my God. Yeah. So it shows that connections, you know, yes. advocating for you. And she had just called this guy for the phone. That's great. So do you have any sort of last words of wisdom? And then we'll open it up. Definitely, I wanted to piggyback on the talk about employment. So at Akilo, I'm on the hiring committee. And so just to give you guys our perspective, I for PIP yesterday, we get like 200 applications. It's mind-blowing how much time <laughs> it takes to go through all these applications and make a meaningful selection. Um, what stands out for me is if I had met you already at a GGU event or another networking event, I would spot you out and be like, and you would write on your resume. And then I met Nikki the other day. It was great to talk to her about Akilo easily puts you in my guest category. Um, things like that helps a lot. When I just see people resumes, I don't have, I don't know who you are, I don't know what your personality is like. It's really, it's a big risk for us. Um, so put yourself out there. If you are in a position where you need to, you know, now, you know, find a job and you're six months down and you're really, really low, start going to those bar association events, <coughs> start finding people that you like and you want to be like and start mingling with them at these um, bar association events. That's what those things are there for. Um, people are really, and you've changed, you know, since you started law school. You guys are now people who have different types of aspirations than you were three, two years ago. Um, you're going to meet people you really honestly like at these bar association events. They're not just going to be people who you don't identify with anymore. They're going to be people who you have the same interests with, like, uh, gone through the same, you know, life stories as you maybe. So I would take the opportunity to make those friends, um, network. Um, and then you never know where they're going to take you. All the, everybody here has the same story. It just it sounds like serendipity, but serendipitous. But actually, the way it works in our legal field in San Francisco and Bay Area. Um, when you do actually get an offer, and it will happen, don't be afraid to bargain for your salary. They're expecting it. Um, it's not going to offend them, and very few people actually do so um, when it is really on the table. I went to a, um, a legal event where I learned that something like only 17% of women actually negotiate their salaries, and I find that number appalling. Um, and it's it's possible even if even if it's your first job. Um,
Um, so thank you guys for coming. Um, so I'm like attorney phobic. Like I can talk to students, professors, no problem. But as soon as like someone has like some letters behind their name, I completely freeze <laughs> up. And I can't think of anything to say, and it's I feel like I'm never gonna get a job ever. <laughs> so I, I just any like entry level like remedial networking tips. You're definitely talking to us now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's true. Nico, I have letters after my name. You and I talk all the time. Yeah, you, you, you've been in the building since door. <laughs> <laughs> that mentality that you have when you are, you need to apply to everybody else, um, regardless of what the last you know, letters of their name would be. Um, we're people, too. You are, you know, we're the same people. You know, you're going to be an attorney one day, and you're still going to be you. Um, cool and, you know, approachable. So talk about things that aren't really related if you're not interested in that kind of connection. Talk about the weather, the food, um, the giants. Yeah. <laughs> That's literally what I was going to recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about things that are not legal related. That's such an easy way. Like, um, For instance, my bare essentials experience, that was when I was interviewing with women literally every single time. They're like, oh, do you wear their products? And that's how we got started. I was like, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> so that's, and then, then we would get started on a whole makeup company. Here I am, a, you know, interviewing for an associate position at a well-established firm. And I'm just like, yeah, we're very essential sometimes. And, you know, like, find non-legal connections with these people. And put things at the bottom of your resume. Like, uh, Gina knows I put on mine uh, some interest and randomly, like, my, about my brother playing for Cal Baseball the year they went to the World Series. That, Cal, if you guys don't know this, people are obsessed with Cal Bay Area, whatever, so Cal shows, but people are. So people just find things that interest other people in the Bay Area, wherever it is, because they'll look at the bottom of your resume and they may start there instead of, they're trying to break the ice too. They're just as nervous as you are to talk to people, you know. I have scuba diving on my resume and I spent a whole interview trying about scuba diving. It had nothing to do with it. With the job or the law. Actually, on that note, sorry, hit on this again. But a lot of times you get called in for these interviews, they already feel that you're qualified or experienced for the position. And the reason that they're calling you in is to see if your personality matches. And they want to talk about non legal things to see how you have how your report is. So keep that in mind when you when you go to these interviews too. I have heard that from a lot of employers. They're trying to see if you're gonna fit because you're you know, spending most of your time there. So we definitely look for fit. Period. So obviously you guys, you know, have been to law school. We already know what you know. We already screen your writing sample. We already know all that. We're just looking purely for fit by the time we meet you. Oh, I wanted to just get back to your um, negotiating with, for your first salary, which just you know right off the bat seems just a little cheeky. <clears throat> I know it's not all taking right your word, but how would you? How did you go about doing that, or how would you suggest breaking that ice without being cheeky? I actually had no option because my salary is set by the government. Um, we're at different grades and levels. Um, however, uh, many of my friends who aren't in the government and actually have a say in their salary, what they would do is oftentimes employers will say, well, what is the salary range you're looking for? Before you go to your interviews, go and research what the average salary is there. Um, start higher than that and uh, kind of feel out what they're seeking. If your first offer, offer if your first uh, suggestion seems to blow it out of the park, then obviously you've gone too high. Uh, but also assess what your needs are too. So if you can make it on $30,000 a year um, in the Bay Area, that, then great. But don't, don't let them know that. Um, and if you have any connections in that field or that office, try to feel out what other people are making as well. So I guess what I'm saying is go in with an idea of what the average is for the office area or whatever, and go a bit higher. And I know it sounds a bit cheeky, but they understand this business. Um, it, it's your livelihood, and they're expecting it. I don't think it's cheeky. You're going to be a lawyer. Like you're going to. If you can't stand up for yourself, then, yeah. then I don't know. But just think of how you would want to be asked. That's how, if I'm in doubt of 
how to say something, I always think about how it would sound somebody was saying to me. And um, so I work as a contract attorney, so I'm paid hourly. And I negotiated for my hourly rate. They offered me a rate, and I figured out what that would be monthly, annually, and um, submitted a counteroffer. Thank you for coming, and thanks to our panelists for your great words of wisdom.